Good morning and warm welcome to Online Analysis, a postgraduate teaching program on Zoom platform sponsored by Acrola and hosted by A1 Logics and aired by Anesthesia TV. Today we are having two eminent scholars in our session of obstetric anesthesia. The first topic is Labor Analgesia Technique by Dr. G. L. Ravindra. He is the Chief Consultant of Janahi Janani Anesthesia and Critical Care Services, Simoha. He is the former professor and head of the Department of Anesthesiology. Simoha Institute of Medical Sciences, Simoha. He has performed more than 13,000 labor epidurals over the period of 15 years. He is the past president of IAC Karnataka State 2003. Interestingly, his hobbies are agriculture. More than that, he is a good friend of mine, Bill Wisher, who supports me through thick and thin. We are happy to have you in our platform, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Edward. It was a nice, kind introduction. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to associate with Edward, who is in a fantastic, phenomenal, dedicated teacher. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Edward. Thank you, sir. Shall I share the screen and start off? You can share, sir. You can start. Yes. Where is my oh, this one? Yes, sir. It's okay. Yeah. So today's topic is, uh, of course, it's a, a vast uh, subject, as Madam Sunanda knows it. Uh, we hold a day-long workshop on labor analgesia techniques, starting from every, everything, history to everything, and to try to concise it as much as possible. But it does not include everything that is there in the textbooks, but most of it I have tried to cover. So the history, if you go to the history of... Uh, uh, labor analysis, yeah. Uh, pain of labor is known to known in the history. So, if you take the the Puranas of uh, the Indian history or uh, the Bible or uh, 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 Quran, in every part of it, in every historical, the mythological uh, literature, the pain of labor is there. This is from the Bible. For I heard a cry as of a woman in travail, anguish as of one bringing forth her first child, the cry of the daughter of Zion gasping for breath, stretching out her hands, oh, is me. So I shall greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shall bring forth many children. So it is said that it's about, the, the, this is the story of Adam and Eve in midst. It says, that in sorrow thou shalt bring forth and many children. Bringing forth the cry. Yeah. Anything? Okay, right. No problem. For thousands of years, efforts are on to avert the pain of labor. So this is the most, this is the hitch here. Opium, alcohol, hashish, etc. are but a few having been used. There are different suggestions in the ancient Indian system of medicine also about the pain relief of labor. 16th of October 1846, as all of us know, ether was first used as an anesthetic by William Thomas Green Martin. Within six months of his invention, in 1847, James Young Simpson used ether for labor analgesia. He called it etherization of childbirth. All pains, labor pains included. This is what uh, uh, Simpson says. All pains, labor pains included is without physiological value. It only degrades and destroys those who experience it. Uh, how, how much is it true in its real sense? I really don't know. I can't exactly ouch and say that, but I can definitely tell you that he always meant that labor pains need not, the labor pains 
and the uterine contraction are separable are two different entities so they can be separated from each other in the next six years there were a lot of concerns over the ethical and moral issues of averting labor pains there are a lot of discussions going on the the church really did did oppose the etherization of labor and uh, simpson had a tough time for some days one of them was charles d meeks labor pains has a labor pain has a purpose this is what he says that uterine pain is inseparable from contractions and that any drug that abolishes pain will alter the contractions this is what charles d meeks has told and he said no drug labor is probably the best uh, uh, best way uh, this is in the beginning you know that's that's how uh, he opposed meeks opposed uh, simpson one of the person who supported uh, meeks was paul zweifel he detected chloroform in the umbilical blood and umbilical blood and urine of the newborns and said that the inhaled anesthetics are excrete are have a transplacental transfer and it is it goes to the fetus and fetal ill effects are a possibility that's how he tried to support meeks john snow on the 7th of april 1853 he used chloroform on queen victoria by the request of the king and the queen for the birth of her eighth child prince leopold the pleasure and the gratitude the queen had was exemplary she said it's a boon to womanhood thus inhalation and anesthetics and also labor and analgesia got a royal stamp this is what happened what a blessing she had chloroform perhaps without it her strength would have suffered very much this is what her husband the king said and within the next two years she gave birth to her ninth child the princess beatrice and again she took um, labor analgesia with chloroform in the next 50 years it was only the inhalation anesthetics which rode the field of labor analgesia during the 1930s and the 40s concerns grew over the fetal and maternal safety of this technique acid aspiration uterine relaxation and pph fetal mortality etc many things were many bad effects of the of inhalational anesthetics being used as a labor analgesics you know came to the front so in the 1940 it was hadley who used regional anesthesia for this purpose for labor analgesia since then anesthesiologists worldwide have not looked back and it is epidural or spinal the gold standard to anal labor pains now what are the various options available for our, for labor analgesia so here are a few options we have non pharmacological and pharmacological now let me go through the non pharmacological ones first the first and the foremost is the childbirth preparation now this is a very very useful technique now in childbirth preparation we are we are we are actually preparing the mother for the childbirth in the sense during the antenatal period psychologically she is being prepared she will be educated on how to bear the pain what is to be done and the involvement of the entire family husband especially husband and the other family members how to bear the pain and what is to be done about the child care and, and such things and if the mother is prepared for childbirth she would be in a better position to bear the pain this is what is important so one of the non pharmacological techniques which has a a very good bearing is childbirth preparation any technique for labor analgesia you use be it be an inhalational anesthetic be it be uh, systemic analgesics regional anesthetics whatever you use if it is supported with childbirth preparation probably the success rate and the maternal satisfaction would be excellent the second technique is hypnosis the parturient is put in a state of uh, deep concentration by the hypnotherapist the next one is electroanalgesia uh, not very 
I don't know how uh, it can work. This is neither tense nor the magnetic magnetotherapy. Electrical magnets are formed around that area with with uh, the uh, with the uh, uh, paddles there, and uh, it is being stimulated, and probably the the SPA the stimulus produced analgesia system that is the uh, using the gate control theory of pain probably works. The next one is the tense. Tense is the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. This is one of the uh, most scientific of all the uh, non-pharmacological techniques. Works by release of endorphin locally and blocks the pain transmission to the brain by A fiber stimulation. You know, when the peripheral A fiber stimulation uh, are stimulated, it blocks the transmission of the uh, A delta fibers. Now, this is the principle of uh, tense. During the first stage, around the area of the dermatome of T, uh, uh, T11, 12, and L1, the paddles are kept. And in the second stage, they are kept low down somewhere in the sacral region. <clears throat> now, the next thing is the acupuncture, a mode of peripheral stimulation based on the activation of peripheral stimulate uh, receptors, sensory nerve fibers, uh, sensory nerve fibers, or the peripheral stimulate uh, receptors, all of them. Now, how acupuncture works and what is the basis of acupuncture? Uh, I don't know. Not much of correlation is there uh, because the nerve supply at the areas where it is the needles are being kept and the other and and it is and where you expect to get the analgesia are totally different but for labor analgesia in labor analgesia they for labor analgesia they place the needles in the back so that is one place exactly probably somewhere something like uh, tens it it should work but um, how far it is useful nobody knows the only thing I can tell you is that they are effective in selected population and they, it is not reproducible in a large population. That's the most important hitch here. Hydrotherapy is one thing where the transdermal water blocks are given. Distilled water, one ml of distilled water injected at four points. Four points in the sense at the point of posterior superior iliac spines and the posterior inferior iliac spines on either on either side. Four points are taken and one ml subcutaneous intradermal and subcutaneous injection of distilled water is made. And how it works, I don't know exactly. And some people claim that it works very well. I have no reason. I, I don't have any reason why it should work, but re again, not reproducible. Aromatherapy, that is different aroma from Tulsi, uh, many things from oranges, uh, uh, many aromas are being used. And again, all of them probably act by, uh, you know, diverting the patient's mind. So individuals mind from labor pains. So they probably act very well in the early stages of labor pains, but when the real intensity of the labor pains increase, they usually fail. Now, the next important question is, do parturients require pain relief? Analgesia, when do we ask for pain relief? We are, we, see, we don't, <coughs> is pinch painful? It is. Does it require pain relief? No, we don't take any kind of pain relief for these, the uh, small, somebody coming and pinching you with you know, affection. Now, do we give a local block for these, in these situations? No, not at all. We don't do that. So what does, what is that which determines? How about this one? 
when there is a scorpion bite, the pain is so bad that we do give a local block. Any systemic analgesia here is not going to be very useful in, in the situation. We do give. So what is that which determines? The determination is the intensity of pain. If the intensity of pain is very severe, we ask for pain relief. If the pain is, the intensity is less, we don't ask for it. Now, with this in background, let's see the next thing. Now, this is <clears throat> Melzak and Torgerson in, from the McGill University. They formed a rating scale for pain and they published this in the pain journal. And the study was conducted over five years. 47,000 subjects were used. All people, all subjects who attended the emergency department with some kind of aches and pains. And these aches and pains were uh, divided into three groups, labor pain, pain syndromes, and traumatic pain. And all of them were asked to rate their pain in a scale of 50, from zero to 50. And then they were asked to put it up across. Now, of a digit. Oh, both of them stayed at the same point, anywhere between 30 to 40. Am I audible? Yes, sir. There is a small disturbance in the audio. Okay. Yeah. Now, now uh, am I all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audio. You go on. <laughs> yeah. So, labor pains as well as the uh, traumatic pain of the amputation of a digit, both of them are almost of the same intensity between anywhere between 30 to 40 on a rating scale of 0 to 50. Now, now let's see. Let me ask a question to everyone here. How many of you believe that anesthesia is mandatory for this surgical procedure? If you want to surgically do an amputation, whether anesthesia is mandatory or not? Now, when I asked, can it be done this way? Four people holding and then chopping it off. It, this was being done years ago. But now everybody feels that in some kind of anesthesia, analgesia is required for that procedure. Let me ask another question. A primary in labor four centimeters dilated in agony, real agony. How many of you believe that labor analgesia is mandatory for this lady? None of us believe that it is mandatory. All of us believe that it is only optional. If the facility is there, if somebody is there to give epidural, if somebody is there to do something, otherwise it's not necessary at all. Now, why this discrimination? The reasons are many. Number one reason is that labor pain is physiological and inevitable. When I say inevitable, I only mean this. A lady who is term, uh, you know, who has reached term, goes into labor. Now, she has to deliver. She has no choice. Once she is in labor, she has to deliver. The, the labor pain ends with delivery only. She cannot postpone it for some reason. That is the reason why I'm telling that this is inevitable pain. Now it's universal, affecting practically all women, irrespective of caste, creed, nationality, race, anything. It is irrespective of that. It affects only women, you see, and not men. So when it does not affect men, the 50% of population taken off. So they don't have any kind of majority. So the sufferers do not have a single simple majority also. Now the sex ratio is uh, less for uh, ladies, you see, women. And even amongst women, it only affects a fraction, just that fraction, who are in the refractive age group. As long as the lady is a bohu, is, a, you know, is, the, is the daughter-in-law, and she is asking me for, I want, we want epidural, she is fine. She is asking for it. 
the moment the sas becomes the bahu becomes a sas that is the daughter in law becomes a mother in law she turns around she joins the other side and starts asking why why epidural why mujhe to nahi mila tha there was no labor pains from there was no labor analgesia for me why for you and this is one of the reason why labor pains labor analgesia is not being accepted labor pains is only partial it has see this is the only pain which has an attractive outcome the baby comes out after the labor, labor pains now all the smiles the cry the all the activities of this baby it will make the mother forget about the labor pain and within the next two years she's ready she's come back to the obstetrician for the next with the next pregnancy because this is the only pain which has an excellent outcome so these are re some of the reasons why labor pain labor analgesia does not have attain this good popularity so the roughly just an 8% population that's why it is not happening now let's go to the other uh, further let's go further with the techniques non pharmacological and pharmacological pharmacological you can divide them into inhalational systemic and uh, regional inhalational systemic and regional anesthesia okay so this is some of the slides sorry some of these slides are getting repeated mm. ah. <clears throat> the last sentence in the chestnut's uh, textbook of obstetric anesthesia in that chapter on non pharmacological techniques of uh, labor analysis yeah, he writes this no non non pharmacological technique consistently provides the quality of pain relief that is provided by neuraxial anesthesia this is the last sentence he writes and finally he says the quality of anesthesia is what is important and that is provided only by neuraxial anesthesia he says but psychoprophylaxis is one technique which has scores over many other things if it is given with you know with any technique for that matter antenatal classes childbirth preparation family centered care one to one care of labor pains if it is associated then the maternal satisfaction is excellent with any technique that you you are using <clears throat> so this study evaluated the results from 21 uh, studies this is a meta analysis that included 15000 women suggested that women who received one to one support during labor were less likely to use less likely to use neuraxial analgesia that means if epidural is given as an option to them how many of them are the takers for it if their childbirth preparation was there less number of people opt for labor analgesia more number of people would tolerate the pain incidence i am talking about and any other type of analgesia they would not ask for and they are more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal delivery and satisfaction with birth child birth experience whether they take lab, labor analgesia or not their maternal satisfaction would be higher if it is supported by one to one support so this one is psychoprophylaxis with any technique has a greater role historically opioids are used extensively in labor analgesia for long years it has been used but <clears throat> simpson used it in 1847 okay these are the inhalational anesthetics early 1881 entonox nitrous oxide 1961 entonox was used and they were popular till the 1950s when epidural became more popular and entonox is a very useful technique the most popular in uk and scandinavian countries managed mostly by midwives and nurse anesthetists it is the advantages are it can be administered with a simple equipment very simple equipment which has a non rebreathing valve only patient herself can hold the mask and start inhaling there is no there are no needles can stop administering suddenly whenever the complication you can stop administering it the moment you feel that it, there is some complication you can just take off very good analgesia 
in early labor. So the quality of analgesia is excellent early in labor, but later on the quality comes down with, you know, with the increase in the intensity of pains. A systematic review of 16 studies said that there is no neonatal depression trans in spite of the transplacental uh, transfer of nitrous oxide, there is no neonatal depression. Disadvantages of nit nitrous oxide are only nausea and vomiting, drowsiness, dizziness, environmental pollution from unscavenged gases, all these may be significant. And they concluded that nitrous oxide is not a potent labor analgesic. They finally concluded that it's not a potent labor analgesic. VAP score may remain as high as five to six of 10, especially as the labor progresses. But maternal satisfaction is high in spite of the high VAP scores. The reason is that this nitrous oxide is being entonox is being used by the midwives. And the midwife, after giving the labor analysis, stays there by the side and she keeps talking to the mother. And this one-to-one -one contact is what gives them a very good maternal satisfaction. So it is not the quality of the entonox, but it is the presence of the person who is administering all through the uh, labor and giving her a, you know, support. So the same thing if it is done with epidural labor analgesia, probably the maternal satisfaction will be 100%. So narcotics in labor analgesia, systemic opioids are used commonly for labor analgesia because of lack of other facilities. Across the world, the commonest labor analgesic that is used is mepiridine, pethidine. They are used because they are inexpensive, they are widely available, and you don't require anybody to give it. A midwife also can give, obstetricians can administer. You don't require the presence of an anesthesiologist. They can be administered intramuscularly without IV access. It is easy to give an injection. In current practice, long-acting opioids include morphine, hydromorphone, and uh, pethidine. Short-acting opioids include fentanyl, sufentanyl, and remifentanyl. Antagonist, agonist antagonists like pentothecine, tramadol, butorphanol, buprenorphine, all of them have been used, but with little effect and being used because of lack of higher good facilities. Disadvantages are either maternal or neonatal. Pain relief is inadequate in most cases. Maternal sedation is a great disadvantage. Nausea, vomiting, gastric stasis, all of them can occur. Fetal neonatal, all drugs easily cross the, cross the placenta. Fetal heart rate effects lo like loss of B2B variability, sinusoidal rhythm, all of them are a possibility. Dose-related maternal neonatal depression is a possibility. Newborn neurobehavioral depression, dose-dependent, again, are, is a possibility. Efficacy is anywhere between 25 to 30 percent only. Meperidine worldwide is the most commonly used intramuscularly up to from uh, intravenously 25 milligrams or intramuscularly 50 milligrams is what is advocated. But what is administered is 100 milligrams IM anytime. Whether it is, uh, whether that dose is required for analgesia or not, any, see, when we give 50 milligrams pethidine intramuscularly, and when we give 100 milligrams pethidine intramuscularly, the analgesia is the same. The side effects are more. So, but it is being given. One ampule contains 100 milligrams, and 100 milligrams is given. Maternal half life is two to three hours. Fetal and newborn half life is, is still significantly longer, 13 to 23 hours. Active and potentially neuro neurotoxic metabolite, normepiridine, is always there, it gets accumulated. <clears throat> morphine is rarely used. It has an active metabolite in the form of morphine 6-glucuronide, yes. And longer neonatal depression as well as adult depression is a possibility. Fentanyl is the most accepted systemic opioid that we have. A rapid of onset of effect, 
you know, peak effect within two to four minutes after intravenous administration, short duration of action, 30 to 60 minutes, lack of active metabolites, and, you know, neonatal depression is extremely rare. It is almost not there. 100 micrograms of fentanyl intravenously given 15 minutes before the delivery also does not cause significant neonatal depression. So that is why that's one of the greatest advantages of fentanyl for the use in, uh, for the systemic use. Compared neonatal responses, this study compared the neonatal responses in women who received IV fentanyl 50 to 100 mic micrograms as often as once per hour in the met at, uh, or at uh, maternal re request and women who did not receive analgesia in, in all of them, it was compared and the results were stunning. There was no difference between the groups in the neonatal APGAR scores, respiratory status, and neurological and adoptive capacity scores. So that means that from the point of view of the neonatal depression, fentanyl is a very safe drug. Remifentanyl is the most uh, you know, uh, recent of all the uh, narcotics that is being used in uh, uh, labor analysis here, yeah? but that is also off late in the past 10 years, it's going, uh, uh, going out of fact, uh, practice. An alternative, they, when it came, I still remember in 2008, I think in 2008, there was an AOA conference at uh, Chandigarh and there was, uh, I don't remember his name, a consultant who came from United States and uh, from U UK, he spoke on remifentanyl IV PCA and he said, on the stage, he said, in the next 10 years, epidural is going to go out of practice. Now, this is what he, his statement he made, but uh, I don't think that has happened from 2008 to 2018, it has not changed. Remifentanyl is almost going out of practice rather than epidural. It's an ultra short acting opioid, highly metabolized by placenta esterase. Fetal maternal ratio is small. Onset time is just 20 to 30 seconds. So whenever the pain is there, it can be administered. That means in PCA, when the patient has the pain, she can press the button and get analgesia. Peak effect is within 80 to 90 seconds and effective analgesia half-life is six minutes. So it is an ultra shock acting opioid. It can be used as a, uh, an infusion. Remifentanyl readily crosses placenta, but extensively redistributed and metabolized by the fetus. So fetal neonatal depression is very little. Ideal parental analysis, labor analysis, true, but over a period of time, remifentanyl causes maternal depression. And that is the reason why there are many maternal depression and uh, respiratory arrests and that is the reason why it is going out of market. IVPCA, okay. So maternal respiratory depression is the most important complication that can occur with remifentanil. So that leaves us with the regional techniques, the lumbar epidural, caudal epidural, combined spinal epidural, and the subarachnoid block. Uh, Dr. Edward? Can we just break for a minute to break the monotony? And uh, if you, if anybody has a question, one or two questions, if you have any questions, just to break the monotony. There is only two questions, sir. Yes, so what yes, is the please. Lamas method of labor pain? Yeah, Lamas technique is, Lamas, you know, he uh, introduced it. I think I mentioned it one level. It, yeah, Lamas technique is maternal childbirth preparation. Basically a childbirth preparation. Presence of husband is the most important thing which, uh, which he advocated. I don't know. To me, if you ask me, in my practice, I do not allow the husband at all. Husband presence, of course, to a certain extent, increases the maternal satisfaction, but they are a nuisance. So the, they add nuisance value also, apart from the uh, maternal satisfaction. So I do not allow, but I don't know. The, that's an individual opinion. Presence of husband, childbirth preparation, antenatal classes, exercises, maternal exercises to uh, take the uh, bear the pain. This is what is Lamy's technique. Okay. So one more question, sir. 
the Partha Sarathi from Kumbhakonam, he wants to know whether you are practicing opioids for labor and energy. Opioids in the Are you practicing? Are you systemic. practicing opioids? No. Are you asking me systemic opioids or epidural opioids? He mentioned only opioids. So you... Yeah. yeah. I am using both of them. I use systemic opioids when regional anesthesia is either contraindicated or when there is a great demand for analgesia at patient acceptance. Patient is refusing to take la uh, labor epidural. These are the two reasons. One, there is contraindication for epidural. The other one, the mother refuses epidural and wants some kind of analgesia. That is when I use systemic uh, uh, opioids. And what I use is fentanyl. Fentanyl, uh, of course, uh, I set up an infusion of fentanyl and give a bolus dose of fentanyl also. And uh, it works very well. Say about 30, 30 to 50 mics of fentanyl per hour is what is required. And uh, it's a little larger dose, but that is required. Uh, and of course, regional anesthesia, I will come to that. I'm going to speak about it. Without fentanyl, there is no epidural at all in my practice. Okay, sir. You carry on, sir. Yeah. So <laughs> that brings us to the uh, uh, regional techniques. Now, I have given you a few choices. Now, there are about three or four choices. Lumbar epidural, caudal epidural, combined spinal epidural, and subarachnoid block. Caudal epidural for obvious reasons of, you know, the, the, the maternal cleanliness and maintenance of the epidural catheter in that area is very difficult. And that is the reason why nobody uses caudal epidural these days. So that goes out of... Uh, my discussion. Now you are left with three things. One, uh, um, lumbar epidural, combined spinal epidural, and spinal. Now how to uh, decide on that? It will come in my uh, discussion. Now from here onwards, it's an unconventional talk. I don't want to go through that systematic, like, systematic way. I'm going to decide, I'm going to ask questions to myself and answer those questions. Number one, CSE. How to decide on this thing? When CSE is being decided? It is either given very early in labor or late in labor. This is in my practice. Only two indications. When you are using epidural, choosing labor analgesia very early in labor, you, I use a, a CSE. Or very late in labor, I use CSE. The reasons are simple. When I'm using very early in labor, okay. Okay. When I'm using very early in labor, the spinal component is only fentanyl. Say about 20 to 25 mics. Sometimes even, even nowadays I'm using only 10 mics also. Even 10 mics spine intrathecal works very well. Just the 10 mics fentanyl. And when I give it, very early in labor, you don't require anything else. And usually, if the mother asks for labor analgesia very early in labor, I don't give epidural at all. At that time, just 10 mics will give analgesia for about three to four hours. Three to four hours analgesia we get very early in labor. And when the pains appear now, second time, and, and the pains become intolerable, at that time, my epidural takes over. This is CSC in very early in labor. Late in labor, now when late in labor, what happens is the mother will be very, very uncooperative. She doesn't even allow you to place the epidural catheter for that matter. Not all, but a few of them would be very, very uncooperative. When they are very uncooperative, all of us are very familiar with spinal. We are, you know, daily we are doing spinal, so we are all, all anesthetists are very familiar with spinal. So with just even in the most uncooperative patients, we can get into the uh, lumbar, epidural, lumbar spinal space and do an LP and then uh, give us spinal dose. Here I give about 1 to 1 1.5 milligrams of PPOK. 
Bupivacaine heavy, 10 to 12.5 milligrams is for cesarean section. 10 to 12.5. Now, what I am giving is 1 to 1.5 milligram only. Very small dose with about 10 mics of fentanyl or 15 mics of fentanyl. And that puts the patient into comfort first. The patient becomes pain-free. Now she will be very cooperative. I place an epidural catheter and I continue the analgesia when once the spinal effect wears off. So CSE indication is very early in labor or late in labor. And very early in labor, I can even make it a walking epidural because I'm not using any intrathecal local anesthetic at all. So there is no motor locket at all and it becomes very effective. So that is CSE. The second one is single shot spinal. How to decide? Single shot spinal is when the labor is really imminent in the next half an hour to 45 minutes. That means in a multi, very late in labor, especially in a multi, full dilated, fully dilated and, the, and it's crowning and the patient wants the analgesia now. Till then, she didn't want it. And she wants it now. Then it is very simple. Just go ahead and give a spinal, single shot spinal. I don't even place an epidural catheter. 1 to 1.5 milligrams of bupivacaine with about 10 to 15 mics of fentanyl. Intrathecally, I give it. And she gets an excellent analgesia for the next half an hour to 45 minutes. And most of the times, the uh, delivery takes place in, in that time. In all other cases, it is lumbar epidural. Now, this is how we choose my technique. Now, when, when I've decided it, now the question is, when to institute epidural? This, this is the next question. Whether it is very early in labor, late in labor, or an empirical figure of 5 centimeter dilatation, say 3 centimeters or 4 centimeter, 5 centimeter dilatation is what is required. See, what has happened is, this question came up somewhere in the 1990s and uh, somewhere between 1980s and you know, 2000. In that two decades, this question came when they were using high concentration local anesthetics, like say 0.25%. See, somewhere in 1950s when they started epidural labor analysis, they, was, they were giving 0.5% bupivacaine epidurally. That was for cesarean section. They could have done a cesarean section also. So the motor block was extensive, but they came down to 0.25%. Then also the motor block was extensive. 0.25% also produces extensive motor block. But at that time, they felt that the progress of labor was very slow because the perineal muscle tone was lost. So the head descent of the head and the rotation was at stake. That is when they uh, had, they were thinking that if you institute epidural very early in labor, labor will not progress. So wait till about five centimeters dilatation when the head is nicely fixed and it's entering the pelvis, that is when you give the epidural. But nowadays we are using with low, very low concentration local anesthetics with fentanyl, of course, with, with the um, uh, narcotics. So the quality of analgesia is excellent. So we can always, the motor block is almost you know, almost nil. So that is when it is this, this uh, question of uh, empirical five centimeter dilatation does not appear at all. <clears throat> now, so very early in labor, late in labor or five centimeter dilatation is, is not the question. Now, what is there is, oh. so when we ask for pain relief, we ask pain relief when the intensity is unbearable, right? So, ACOG has made a recommendation and it said that whenever the mother asks for labor analysis, whenever she demands it, give it. So what is now the present day indication is that at maternal, mat, maternal demand, you give um, uh, the epidural. But if here, this is again, a, uh, there is a hitch here also. Maternal satisfaction is very low if you give it very early in labor, very, very early in labor, when she asks for it, she, the moment if she asks for it, if you start giving it, if it is very early in labor, maternal satisfaction is extremely low. For that, you know, the reason, there is a simple reason. People who have experienced hunger only know the value of food. 
they know what is the value of food others for others many things matter taste ambience company many things matter you see food is never the value of food is never wasted ne never understood a lot of food is being wasted similarly only those who have experienced strong labor pains appreciate the value of relief from it. so if you administer epidural in very early in labor their maternal satisfaction will be low they start complaining for them even a small itch here and there uh, the the labor cot not very comfortable not soft all these things are epidural failures for them so it is it's it's a question of you know you have to take a decision you have to make the you have to weigh properly when to give the epidural so in the absence of medical indication maternal request is a sufficient medical indication for pain relief during labor this is what the acog recommends so weigh the advantages and disadvantages and then take a decision now the second question is identification of the epidural space how do you identify the epidural space there are two techniques we all know loss of resistance technique and negative pressure technique we use of use the loss of resistance or the negative pressure in the epidural space for identification of the epidural space all techniques which use the negative pressure dependent techniques fail often in uh, in obstetric population the reason is that the pressure in epidural pressure in pregnancy term pregnancy is anywhere between 2 to 4 cm of water positive pressure there is no negative pressure at all and especially in labor when the patient is straining the pressure may go up to 50 to 60 cm of water very high pressure it is so if you try to use the negative pressure dependent technique you will often fail so any of this like hanging drop technique or epidrum or Uh, all of them epidural or whatever it is all of them fail so this is the epidural pressure you see 2 to 4 cm of water in non pregnant minus 2 to 4 and in term pregnancy it's 2 to 4 cm of water whereas during contractions it is go up to 60 cm of water now the third question is when you have decided on loss of resistance whether to use saline or air okay now there are a few advantages disadvantages of either technique number one is accidental dural puncture incidence is extremely low with saline compared to air air has a slightly higher incidence of accidental dural puncture compared to this uh, uh, saline patchy block pneumoencephalus air embolism all of them are a possibility with air <clears throat> the only disadvantage with uh, saline is that when you use saline for identification of the epidural space when you disconnect the syringe the saline drips back so you may get confused whether you have done an accident dural puncture or the saline is coming out so now for that reason most of the times most anesthesiologists do not prefer uh, uh, saline but once you start using saline you will not go back but whatever the whatever is said and done the technique of your choice you are comfortable with is what is to be used if you are comfortable with loss of resistance to your air go ahead and use it there is nothing wrong but don't push too much of air the the, the first year resident when he learns you know epidural he pushes about 5 ml of uh, air in it and the second year resident is by the side and this resident wants to show him uh, he pushes another 10 ml of air into it to demonstrate the loss of resistance and now this is bad so don't push too much of air use less than 1 ml of air only for recognition air pockets around a narrow root when we have pushed lot of air in it can form a you know it can form an air pocket around the narrow root and that narrow root may not get blocked at all because does not come in contact with the uh, does not come in contact with the narrow root so it may not get blocked at all and that is what creates that can create a problem the next issue is 
what are the drugs used in epidural embryopathy? This is an important uh, subject because I will go a little de in detail to it. Drugs used in epidural, there are three groups of drugs. Number one, local anesthetics. All these local anesthetics are used. The one which is which has stood the test of time is bupivacaine, anywhere between 0.0625% to 0.125%. The second group of drugs are narcotics. And of them, fentanyl and sufentanyl are the most popular ones. Two mics per cc of fentanyl or 0.5 to one mic per cc of sufentanyl. And adjuvants in the form of neosigmine uh, or uh, clonidine, dexmedetomidine, all of them. But none of them have an approval for epidural use in labor, in obstetric setup. So it's better not to be better not to be used. But a lot of studies have come up these days. Um, I don't know when most of them are being done, are being used because of lack of fentanyl availability. So they use the other adjuvants because fentanyl is not available. And efficacy wise also, none of them match the analgesia that fentanyl produces. So when we use local anesthetics and narcotics, narcotics alone, when you use, when used also, may not give you good analgesia because they take care of the visceral pain only. Whereas when you use local anesthetics also, they also do not give very good pain relief in low concentration. So the best combination, the best thing to do is a combination of a local anesthetic and a opioid. In a, in a good concentration, in very low, minimal concentration is the best thing to do. We have a few combinations that we normally use. Uh, you don't get these terminologies in any of the textbooks. Uh, the first two, LDM and ULE, are coined by my good friend, Dr. Sunil Pandya. And uh, the third one, the men uh, and the Ren, men and Ren, which I use uh, off late, are coined by me. And these are used in my setup only. In the sense, they are specific to our setup and we have formed this uh, terminologies. And form, forming a terminology for a particular mix is very useful because you can just tell them, give 10, 10 ml of LDM. That is, that's it. You don't need to tell her that load this much of local anesthetic, add this much of fentanyl and then go ahead. And So they are standardized fixed dosages. So what we have is this, an LDM is a slightly higher concentration of the local anesthetic, 0.1% bupivacaine with fentanyl 2 mics per cc. An ultralight epidural, the, the ULE is bupivacaine slightly lower concentration, 0.0625% with always fentanyl 2 mics per cc. And uh, MEN is <clears throat> another one, which is the uh, mixture epidurals new, when it came, when leobupivacaine came for the first time, I started using it, men. Leobupivacaine, 0.1% with fentanyl 2 per, mics per cc. And now we have that REN also, rupivacaine epidural new. REN is rupivacaine, 0.15% with fentanyl 2 mics per cc is what I use. These are the four mixtures which we are using. LDM, ULE, men and REN. Now, when we know, when we have decided on what drugs to use in what concentration, now, what is the volume to be used? What should be the first dose of the epidural? Now, whatever concent whatever is the mixture that you have chosen, the first dose for the epidural is between 10 to 15 ml in fractionated doses. So always never give, when I say 15 ml, don't give 15 ml uh, uh, straight away. Give 5 ml, wait for about 3-4 minutes, then give another 5 ml, wait for about 3-4 minutes. Each time, evaluate the VAP score and you try to reach a VAP score of less than 2. That is what is important. Wait for 10 minutes and then test the level of the block. Always target, your target should be the VAP score, a visual analog pain score of less than 2 is what is required. Most of the times with 10 to 15 ml, especially if the 
mother is in in labor with say about uh, uh, less than three to four centimeters uh, dilated with just 10 ml of the ultralight epidural that is 0 0.0625 percent bupivacaine itself the VAP score reaches zero zero itself but we accept anywhere between less than two a less than two one VAPs is what we normally accept a mother who is in this kind of a facial uh, appearance should reach this level of a smiling smiling mother with smiling mother with uh, you know pointing to the lowest uh, vap score at the low to the lowest vap score now we have given the uh, chosen the epidural place the catheter given the first dose and the patient is comfortable okay now, how do we maintain this patient? Maintenance, how do we top up? The, the critical, the most important thing is that top ups are always timed. We don't wait for the pain to appear. We usually give it at 90 minutes. Supposing we are given the first dose at 11 o'clock, the next dose is given at 12.30 fixed dosages and the volume is equal to the initial dose. The if the first dose requirement is 10 ml of my concentration, whatever I have chosen, the next dose is also the same thing, 10 ml. If it first dose itself, the requirement was high end, so 15 ml, I give 15 ml for the top up also. Now, it is always fractionated doses. Use them as test dose. That means that every time you give 5 ml, 5 ml, 5 ml, in 5 ml aliquots only. Supposing most of the times as the labor progress progresses, you would require a higher concentration as well as a higher volume of the, uh, the, the local anesthetic mixture. See, the, the early in labor, the pain pathways are the pain is related to T11 and 12 only in first stage in T11 and 12 only. Now the one segment up above and one segment below are recruited as the labor progresses. Now the intensity of pain increases. Apart from the intensity of pain, the, the area with which you are drugged to spread also is required. You require T11 and 12 only to be blocked in very early in labor. Whereas you need to block from T11 to L1 in late, I, I mean the active phase of the first stage itself. Whereas in second stage, of course, you need the sacral blockade. That is different. In first stage itself, you would require. So you may require a higher concentration of the local anesthetic as the labor progresses. So the, if the first dose is at 11 o'clock, the second is at 12.30 uh, and the third dose should fall at 2 o'clock, right? Now, supposing at one o'clock itself, if the patient complains of pain, it means, and you call them as breakthrough pains. Now this for the breakthrough pains, we usually give half the original dose and don't count it. Again at two o'clock, I, I give the full dose again. And in such case, I usually step up to the higher concentration from ULE, that means 0 0.0625% to 0.1% percent we step up. Now, okay, we have maintained well, labor has gone through well, and the patient has progressed to second stage. Now, how do we maintain the second stage labor pains? The first and the foremost thing is counseling. Now, you must, when to counsel is the question. See, if the mother is in severe labor pains, you give her analgesia. Of course, you have to take the consent and all that pain, everything has to be done. After taking the consent, you give labor analgesia. Now, when the patient is in good, you know, in good analgesia and is smiling, that is when you counsel her and prepare her for the second stage. Tell her that during second stage, the analgesia may not be excellent. You may have to tolerate the pain to a certain extent. I don't say that we will not give 100% pain relief, but if it fails, 
and if the analgesia is less then our counseling prior would come to effect so first thing is second stage of pains maintenance you counsel the patient well in advance the second is large doses of the mixture so what i do is i use the same low concentration 0.0625% itself in large volumes what we require is a extensive spread of the local anesthetic rather than a higher concentration for to make an extensive spread we need a larger volume so i use sometimes up to 25 ml so the sec the next there are two other things which i have i'm uh, you know it's uh, it's you know controversial topics number one whether sitting position is helpful for the management of uh, second stage pains or not uh, the gravity spread of the local anesthetic in the epidural space is always questioned i know it but the question is in practice if you load the drug if you if you top up if you inject the local anesthetic if you inject the mixture into the epidural space in the sitting position make the patient sit up and inject while injecting if you maintain a sitting position some preferential spread to the caudal definitely occurs and this is being used and this is and of course in practice that has helped very much to to me as well i make the patient sit up and give my dose in second stage another technique which is described is large dose of fentanyl anywhere up to 75 to 100 mics epidural it seems i don't know how it acts i i have no reason why it can be used in this uh, at this time fentanyl takes off the visceral pain only and failure of the second stage of pains labor pains failure of labor analgesia in second stage is because of the somatic pain relief uh, not being addressed to and fentanyl i am sure cannot act in that way so this i am skeptical about i will not do it at all now the next in, in, uh, uh, interesting point is the catheter does not that does not act now what do you mean by the catheter does, that does not act you have located the epidural space catheter negotiated and charged with the maximum dose after having charged what will happen now 15 minutes later there can be four possibilities the possibility number 1 which occurs in 80 more than 85% of the time is that the epidural is correctly placed the patient is comfortable fine everything is fine you are happy patient happy obstetrician happy everybody is happy this is the first possibility possibility number 2 is an extensive block here is the, the most important thing the most important problem now you see there is excellent analgesia instantaneously the moment you are given within about 2 minutes one one minute there is excellent excellent analgesia extensive motor block with hypotension has occurred now we all know within 2 to 3 minutes if this occurs then it is intrathecal placement it is an accidental dural puncture and an intrathecal placement how to manage it it can be undetected intrathecal catheter or catheter migration how to manage it all of us know it and it is beyond the scope of this uh, discussion so for ex- high spinal block you manage you know how to manage it it's a different uh, uh, situation altogether there is an extensive spread there is a different way of exp- extensive spread here there is lack of analgesia the mother does not have any analgesia or there is a patchy block some segments there is no block at all with signs of high spinal block the Uh, the cervical dermatomes are blocked cervical myotomes are blocked patient is unable to have a hand grip which is not possible cervical spread is there there is no analgesia at all now this can occur with horner syndrome csf cannot be aspirated here and the diagnosis is obvious it's a patchy block and it is subdural it's a little difficult to manage and in subdural spread if you suspect subdural spread of course manage the high spinal block the in the same way and remove the epidural catheter and place difficult 
to placing an epidural catheter again is also difficult. It's not that easy after a subdural uh, spread. So you manage that way. You try and place an epidural catheter in a different space. Now the third possibility is a partially acting or a patchy block. Now let's go a little in detail on this. Patchy block does not mean this, like in patches, you know, acted here, there. No, it's not like that. Usually, a partial blockade follows a particular technique, particular pattern. Number one is an asymmetric block, in which the block on one side is excellent, and the other side is the block level is less. The other side is not properly completely covered. This is an asymmetric block. Or some segments may be typically spared. Some segments are not blocked, some segments are blocked. Or there could be a unilateral block. One side is blocked nicely, and the other side is left open. Or there could be a sacral sparing. Now, these are some of the types of patchy block that we see. The last one is an inadequate pain relief. The block is trans, you know, is translucent. The pain penetrates and seen through the block. This is another important situation. Now let's see what are the causes and how to manage them. <clears throat> These are th this can be due to many reasons. Let's go one by one. The number one reason is inadequate dose. Inadequate range. Every time there is an inadequate range. Edward and uh, me, we, we fight over cavity issue. Now, the, the, the problem is not anything else. The problem is that the dose is inadequate. The second one is that the epidural space contents are so many that sometimes I wonder how my epidural acts. How with so much of tissues, fat, many things there, how my drug spreads nicely and how my epidural is acting. That's how I think. So the spread may not be uniform. The third thing is the dose is, is inadequate in the sense that the you are injecting the, the catheter tip is somewhere else and the nerve root is somewhere else. There could be an air pocket around the nerve root. I have injected. And this air pocket might have uh, not allowed one of the narrow root to get blocked. Or the narrow root maybe is in an unfavorable situation. You are injecting the drug somewhere and the narrow root is lying somewhere else. And that is probably in unfavorable position of the narrow root. Or if you have pushed the catheter too much inside, the catheter might have left the epidural space and lying in the paravertebral space. So now what happens? Part of the nerves, a few nerves only are blocked. There could be some real obstetric causes. Occipital posterior position, transverse position, gynecoid pelvis, scar dehiscence in tolac, full bladder. All these are a possibility where the requirement of your analgesia, the pain intensity is so high that your requirement of the analgesic, those requirement may be very high. So you need to talk to your obstetrician and see whether these are there and try to solve them. An analgesic failure with a true epidural placement is approximately 5 to 8%. That means that even having placed the epidural catheter properly, failure of analgesia is a possibility and you should know how to tackle them. Now, there are two maneuvers that are suggested to salvage your catheter when it is partially blocked. First one is flooding the catheter with an additional, so that the unfavorable position of the epidural, the nerve fibers also come into an uh, a favorable position. The second one is partial withdrawal of the catheter. These are the two techniques which are described. Pull the catheter. See, now you, you probably are seeing it. The catheter is placed about, uh, say, 13, 12.5 centimeters from the 12.5 centimeters, as I see here. So you, it was too much inside. Pull out by one centimeter and charge again. So there is a, a flow chart. What is to be done? Give the full dose of the local anesthetic, wait for another 10 minutes, 
and if there is no satisfactory analgesia now you pull out the catheter by 1 cm and repeat the dose if there is no satisfactory analgesia then also one repetition only recite the catheter you have a very low threshold to recite your catheter you never never sit on a catheter which is not acting well after all it's it's a catheter you see it's not my wife you can always change it so the last one is the there is no analgesia when there is no analgesia what are the possibilities and what is to be done most of the times it is subcutaneous placement detected usually within 30 minutes of placement and due to false loss of resistance see in labor the tissues are in pregnancy in, sorry in pregnancy the tissues are soft because of the hormonal effect so when the tissues are soft you cannot demonstrate a resistance see when there is a resistance to inject and you get a loss of resistance that is what we are using for epidural placement when there is no resistance to injection at all you get a false loss of resistance and that is the reason why you might place these catheters into the subcutaneous planes occurs in about 5 to and, and the next thing is apart from the uh, uh, subcutaneous placement one of the most important reasons for total failure is an intravascular placement of the epidural catheter which occurs in about 5 to 7% of epidural catheterization most of the times it is disconnect it is detected because the blood flows back but undetected intravascular placement aspiration test being negative is always a great possibility and in all these situations there will be failure of the epidural ana analgesia this is the most important thing you need to be very careful about it because you give the intravascular drug those are the drug the drug is drained out of the epidural space so completely drained out to the systemic circulation so there is no analgesia at all so in case there is total failure it is safer to assume that this catheter is probably intravascular i don't know if it is intra if you assume that it is intravascular nobody tops it up again so you assume that it is intravascular pull out the catheter and recite so the intravascular injection there is no analgesia because it is drained out now when there is no analgesia at 15 minutes after a full dose of analgesia assume it to be intravascular and manage it as intravascular catheter now when you think that it is intra if you are in doubt maybe i am in the epidural space and it is not acting well if you are in doubt now you one thing you can do what is known as numbing dose a numbing dose of the local anesthetic is given numbing dose is something see in labor analgesia what we are doing most of the times we don't want any kind of muscle relaxation we don't want motor blood here is a situation you deliberately produce motor blood to detect an intravascular placement so for that what you are using is a you use a relatively as safer local anesthetic lignocaine we all use lignocaine iv for many reasons vtac we use about 60 to 90 mg to obtain the uh, pressor response to laryngoscopy and intubation intubation extubation for all that we use lignocaine uh, intramuscularly so less than 60 to 90 mg lignocaine even if it is intravascular it is safe so what you are using lignocaine 1% 5 ml is just 50 mg of local lignocaine so that can always be that can always be used for analgesia it can always used uh, for test dose numbing dose so use the numbing dose you give the local anesthetic 15 minutes there is no there is partial analgesia numbing dose is when you give the numbing dose within about 15 minutes there should be motor block if there is motor block it is an epidural catheter if there is no motor block no analgesia in 15 minutes after the numbing dose it is intravascular just take it out okay so this is the flow chart give the full dose after 15 minutes if there is partial analgesia pull the catheter by 1 cm 
charged with 50% of the original dose. 15 minutes, no improvement. Give the numbing dose of 1% lignocaine 5 ml. Within 15 minutes, there is no motor block. You assume it to be intravascular, pull out and recite. This is for partial analgesia. On the other side, when there is no analgesia after 15 minutes, don't repeat the dose. Give When there is no analgesia, don't repeat the dose. Give the numbing dose 1% lignocaine 5 ml. And within 15 minutes, if there is no motor block, assume it to be intravascular, remove the catheter and recite. Now, this is a flow chart which has to be followed and it's, it's a very useful flow chart. Now about continuous infusion, uh, the same mixtures are used, ULE or LDM 0.0625% bupivacaine or LDM 0.1% or whatever it is, even levobupivacaine and uh, rupivacaine also in the same dosage can be used. And 12 ml per hour is the basal infusion. Anything less than that, less than 12 ml per hour does not work. 4 ml bolus for breakthrough pains. And it can be set up as a uh, IVP, I'm sorry, uh, epidural PCA, patient controlled analgesia also. 0.05% bupivacaine itself is enough in the early stages. Instead of 0.0625%, you use a slightly lower dose also in early stages and use it later on. One of the most important disadvantages of infusion is when you give it as an infusion, we are in injecting it at a rate of 12 ml per hour, which is a very low rate of infusion, right? The pressure with which the drug is injected into the epidural space is very low. So most of the drug escapes through the most proximal hole of the epidural catheter and just stays there. It does not spread unlike the boluses, which spread nicely. So the in infusion, the local anesthetic, the, uh, the maternal satisfaction spread is less and very high, large doses are required. And motor block is almost a rule with infusion compared to intermittent boluses of the local anesthetic. That is why these days, what is the standard technique is the intermittent boluses maybe programmed intermittent boluses with the epidural infusions itself compared to intermittent boluses which we use by manual intermittent boluses. Combined spinal epidural, I think I have told you earlier uh, how, why it is being used. The dosage, spinal very early in labor, 25 mics of fentanyl. Of course, these slides are made earlier. Nowadays, I use anywhere between 10 and 15 mics of fentanyl only. 90 minutes later, continuous uh, uh, epidural analgesia with the same ULE, what we are doing, and it becomes a walking epidural. Late in labor, now I use bupivacaine 0.5% heavy, 1 to 1 1.5 milligrams with fentanyl, 10 to 15 mics intra thecal. And 90 minutes later, it is epidural analgesia with ULE or LDM. Useful in, uh, very uh, useful in uncooperative patients. Single shot spinal, I think I told you earlier itself, multi is late first stage, second stage. Uh, it is very useful. Just one to 2.5 milligrams of bupivacaine, 0.5% heavy with fentanyl of 10 mics or 15 mics or 25 mics is what is required. Coagulation status and labor epidurals. I think it is beyond the scope of this discussion. The same protocols which we use for uh, you know, the coagulation uh, status with uh, platelet counts and uh, other uh, uh, coagulation abnormalities have to be used. One most important thing which I would like to mention at this time is in preeclampsia, better place an epidural catheter early in labor than late. Because in preeclampsia, probably this patient might land up in coagulation failure. You may not be in a position to place the epidural catheter. Whereas an early previously placed epidural catheter, there is no harm in using it. So place an epidural catheter early in labor in preeclampsia. Uh, so to avoid the problems of coagulation status coming in the way of your epidural. The last issue is about group practice. I am a, a big uh, proponent of group practice. It is solo practice. Delivery is unpredictable. 
complications can occur any time. As a solo roaming anesthesiologist, never practice labor analgesia. This is for the practitioner point of view. The answer is group practice, and that is very very useful. Who should how you should organize the group? It is left to you. Who should be your partner? Anesthesiologist, obstetrician. Only anesthesiologist or obstetricians also. I have tried anesthesiologists and obstetricians, pediatricians in the group, and that has worked very well. Like-minded people is what is important. You need to educate them well. And unless it is a profit sharing group, I always mention this in the obstetric forums. I always tell them that unless a group is profit sharing, it never works. It has to be. The, the the financial uh, benefits to all the members of the team is equally important how to organize a group i i will not go into the details of that yeah thank you so much thank you, uh, thank you so much sir for your mind blowing presentation there are a lot of questions in the chat box i will select a few because okay. of the time factor yeah uh, the first question i think it, it, M. Kannan, it is Professor Kannan, I think. Yeah. For rescue analgesia, what is your experience with lumbar erector spinal block? I am not very much uh, used to using lumbar epidural uh, lumbar erector spinal block. I don't know the answer. I am not using it. For okay. a rescue analgesia, I, I have explained how we do the uh, to salvage the catheter. Maybe. Next year, AOA, I will try this and come out with the answer. Thank you, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So, next question, Ganesh Tendulkar, that is, uh, have you used isobaric intrathecal solution in combined spinal epidural? Yeah, yes, of course, I have. I have used them. Uh, I've not found a great advantage with it. CSE, whenever I use CSE, I always used only narcotics in the early stage. And I have only used, of course, these days, uh, leobupivacaine and rupivacaine heavy are also available. I have not used them so far in labor analgesia. Of course, I've used them for cesarean sections, but bupivacaine heavy is a very useful technique, very useful one. Leo, the, the isobaric uh, analgesics, it's very difficult to limit the dosage and the level. So I've, I've, I've tried using them once or twice. Uh, maybe I think I, I did not I did not continue to use it because of once or twice. Maybe my dosage selection was bad. Hypotension was a great possibility because the level fixing the level was difficult for me. The patient will always be moving. And she sits up. A heavy bupivacaine. If the patient sits up, this level descends. Whereas if the patient sits up in a uh, isobaric one, uh, the, the most of the isobaric ones are slightly hypobaric. So the level spreads up. So that is probably one of the reasons why I start, I, I am not using them. Okay, sir. So how will you prepare this uh, 1 to 1.5 milligram of heavy booby okay? Oh, it's very simple. I always use a 1 ml syringe always use a 1 ml syringe. Now this 1 ml syringe graduations, two markings in that 1 ml syringe gives you 1 milligram. See, 10 markings are there in which 1 ml is 10 markings and it is 5 milligrams. So two markings is 1 milligram. So three markings is 1.5 milligrams. And I mix fentanyl 0.5 ml into that syringe into the one ml syringe, and that gives about point, total volume will be about 0.7 ml. And I do not dilute them. I give it from a one ml syringe and uh, directly inject. So thank you, thank you so much, sir. There are some more questions I will personally send to you for uh, getting an answer from you, sir. Oh, yes, certainly, right. certainly. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You. We will move on to the second topic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So this today, the second topic is difficult and failed intubation strategies prevention and management of air related catastrophes in obstetric patients by dr sunanda gupta he is a emirate professor of geetanjali medical college udaipur he is a founder president of association of obstetric anesthesia india and executive member of aci oceanic 
Society of Obstetric Anesthesia. He is an executive member of Indian College of Anesthesiology Working Committee. Her area of interest is obstetric anesthesia. She has more than 140 publications, written chapters in 14 national and 8 international textbooks. She has written textbook on obstetric anesthesia in 2005. She received 8 awards, delivered 8 orations and delivered lectures in more than 220 conferences. At present, she is the president of uh, NGO. We are pleased to have you in our platform, Madam. Over to you, Madam, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for that uh, kind introduction. Today is an auspicious day for two reasons. First of all, I would like to wish you all, each one of you, a very happy honor with blessings from Lord Mahabali for happiness and prosperity in your lives. And the second occasion on Teacher's Day, I would like to bless uh, postgraduate, may you always be at the forefront of your profession and may you always practice safe anesthesia. So after the energetic lecture from uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Ravi, we are going to talk about strategies for prevention and management of the airway related catastrophes in obstetrical patients. Now, obstetric specific airway management guidelines were published in 2015 by Dr. Mary Mushambi and her team for the anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia society of UK and the difficult airway society. Am I audible? Yes, madam, you are audible. Okay. So these guidelines came specifically because there was a lack of consistency in approach to this issue, which reflected differing skill sets and preference within individuals and the departments. So arguably, it was justified that the need for guidance on a consistent approach to such scenarios. So before I start, I bring to you greetings from my medical college, which is situated among the Aravlis and it has uh, about 1300 beds with all super specialities. And in the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to talk about why is the obstetric airway more vulnerable for failed airway and difficult intubation? What are the current predictors for difficult airway in obstetrical population? We look at the approach towards anticipated, unanticipated, failed difficult airway and a cannot intubate and not, cannot oxygenate scenario. Then two recent guidelines which have a bearing on the obstetric patient is the awake intubation guidelines which have come this year and the unrecognized esophageal intubation by the International Airway Societies where India is also a participant. And then we'll talk about the controversies and dilemma with this issue. So why are parturients vulnerable to the high rates of difficult and failed airway? There is a unique situation where the anatomical and physiological changes of pregnancy have a lot of bearing on the airway and it makes it difficult. Apart from this, the human factors where we are all emotionally charged because we are caring for two lives. There is extreme emergency. We have the obstetricians breathing down our neck that the, uh, there is fetal distress. The environmental issues where most of the caesareans occur at odd hours. Our operation theaters are situated far off. There is a uh, paucity of equipment which is available and of course inexperienced help. Along with this, the system issues where the junior most consultant is posted in the ops OT who has absolutely no um, experience with obstetric general anesthesia and he also has uh, inexperienced help. Apart from this lack of training and technical issues, there are non-technical issues because we are leaders in the operation theaters and we need to be leaders in an emergency situation. 
So this landmark article from Kinsella and this group, which was published in 2015, they looked at all the uh, research which was published from 1970 onwards, more than 45 years. And they found that the incidence of failed intubation had remained unchanged. So rather than being happy, we got more concerned because uh, the incidence of uh, failed intubation is one in 390 in obstetric general anesthesia. It rises to one in 443 for cesarean sections and one death per 90 failed intubations are, is the estimate in this article. So this is five to eight times greater than the non-pregnant individuals. And, but if you look at the incidence of general anesthesia, it has reduced from 75% to 15%. So all the workshops we have been attending, all the difficult airway equipments we have been using, has it really made no difference? Now let us look at why this incidence has been consistent. The pregnant airway is more difficult and atmically there is weight gain and large breasts and airway changes physiologically, uh, a decrease in all the airway uh, volumes, increase in oxygen consumption, then accelerates onset of desaturation during apnea. So the safe apnea period is reduced and there is gastric reflux. So this is attributed to the progesterone levels which are increased. There's an increase in blood volume and as the labor progresses, there is capillary engorgement, mucosal edema and tissue friability. And that is why we do not use the nose for any intubations or any interventions. The oral pharynx is again difficult because there's an enlarged tongue which is difficult for displacement. The laryngeal anatomy is distorted and we need to use smaller size endotracheal tubes. And all these issues are further worsened when you have comorbid conditions like preeclampsia, excess fluids, labor has been conducted uh, without any analgesia. And so the Valsalva maneuver, again, um, already the colloid osmotic pressure is reduced. So there is more of fluid retention. And if the patient has had respiratory tract infection early on. Another article which uh, holds a lot of interest in obstetric anesthesia is the one by Bhavani Kodali, which was published in 2008. And what they found was the pre-labor malampati grading that you did was somewhere around one to two. And with eight hours of uh, labor, you find that in the post-labor period, it has gone up to third. Uh, MPG three or four. So this highlights the importance of doing an AVA assessment right when you are going to subject the patient to surgery and general anesthesia. Now the respiratory and metabolic changes we talked about early, all the uh, volumes are reduced, especially 20% reduction of the functional residual capacity. The closing volume goes above the functional residual capacity and more chances of airway closure especially in the supine and the obese patients. Uh, metabolic requirements for oxygen increases because of the placenta and the fetus. And especially during labor, it increases further by 60%. So there is the early rapid desaturation. And why this is important for us is because the safe apnea time decreases. And this there is profound hypoxemia during rapid sequence induction, which is compounded by difficult intubations. So before we start, we need to ask certain questions. Will I be able to mask ventilate? Will I be able to perform laryngoscopy directly or indirectly? Can I intubate the patient? Is there an aspiration risk? And can I secure the airway awake? And uh, will I be able to access the cricothyroid membrane? How will it behave during extubation? Now, once you have answered these questions in the negative, you decide that who is going to intubate the patient, why not go in for regional anesthesia? So when you decide on regional anesthesia, you should be able to answer these key questions. What happens if regional anesthesia fails? Do you have a plan in sight? A high or total spinal block, that is sudden deterioration of the patient's condition. What if last develops? What if there is hemorrhage and there is prolongation of the surgery? Now, these questions you need to answer before you decide on 
going in for regional anesthesia. An interesting um, uh, message from Tim Cook on the Twitter, at which end of the laryngoscope is the problem? Is it at the patient end? There's anatomical difficulty or physiological difficulty, then you can identify and manage this difficulty. But if it is, it is at the rear end, there's a logistical difficulty, maybe um, high-end equipments are at a premium or there is educational difficulty with lack of training, lack of experience or wrong training. Then you need to eliminate this issue before you think about anesthetizing the patient. So then we come to the first scenario, how will you approach the anticipated difficult airway in the obstetric patients? And what are the predictors of difficult airway? The fourth national audit project, which looked at major complications of airway management in the UK, uh, they declared that if you do a poor airway assessment, then it contributes to a poor outcome. So early on in the labor room, we should form a part of the overall plan for anesthesia. The staff in the labor room should be able to give us an idea that maybe this patient has an anticipated difficult airway and they should refer the patient to the antenatal anesthesia consultation where a detailed airway assessment which includes difficulty in mask ventilation, SED insertion, endotracheal tube insertion, a front of neck axis, all these should be evaluated in the anticipated difficult airway patients. The newer predictors which have helped us a bit, but always remember these predictors are not 100%, uh, we, it does not make us 100% sure that the airway will be difficult. An increase in weight gain more than 11.7 kg, a ratio between chest circumference and sternal mental distance more than 7.1, and a neck circumference more than 39.5 centimeters is heralded as the newer predictors of difficult bag mask ventilation and difficult intubation. Apart from this, of course, the breast enlargement and the full dentition with uh, protruding maxillary incisors will make positioning difficult as well as interfere with the laryngoscopy. Uh, the Task Force of Airway Management Foundation came up with a new approach to airway assessment, the line of sight, and they brought about newer terminologies in the difficult airway. The difficult airway can be divided into assessment of patient factors and non-patient factors, and they called uh, extubation as emergence, which is really uh, a terminology which was floated considering the concept of uh, difficulty during emergence in the, uh, especially in the obstetric patients. The line of sight in the next slide we'll be discussing the difficult and impossible areas. Difficult areas can be optimized, but the impossible areas are not easily optimizable. And then diagnosing airway problems, they should be over diagnosed so that you are well equipped to manage these problems. So what is this line of sight? This line of sight method means you do not miss out any part of the upper airway, right up to the nose, from the nose to the head and neck range of movement. For example, if you look at the head and range movement and you see the variation, if it is less than 90 degrees, means you will be having problems with uh, mask ventilation, laryngoscopy and surgical access. So, this is a very concise table which tells us about the difficulties which we could encounter. Now, early on, briefing of the every team, similar to what the cricketers do, a uh, briefing before they go on to the field. Anesthetic checklist and WHO surgical checklist should be verbalized. Uh, standardization of the difficult airway equipment and its availability should be ensured even out of hours, and that is very, very important. Now, the role of each and every member of the airway team should be specified. Um, you identify who is going to give the required pressure, who is going to um, do other different roles, who is going to call the second anesthetist and where will he be contacted. There should be airway plans 
A, B, C in place? What is your exit strategy? When do you decide to wake up the patient or continue? And discuss with the ops and the neonatology team about these uh, issues. So the first algorithm from the DAS and OA guidelines talks about safe general anesthesia. The most important is a four drawer trolley, which is on wheels and it should be stocked along with documentation and DAS or modified local guidelines should be available on the trolley, checklist, logbooks. Along with this, each drawer should be labeled and you should know what equipments are there. You means the whole airway team should be knowing about it. What will be kept on top of the trolley? What would be kept on the side of the trolley? All these are really important. And you should also routinely check the availability of the, the equipments which are present in the drawers. And as I said, GA and WHO surgical checklist should be verbalized. How do you prepare the patient? An optimal patient positioning is important. A 20 to 30 degree uh, head up position and ramp position will help you facilitate insertion of the laryngoscope. It improves the glottic view and it also increases the functional residual capacity and reduces the risk of uh, gastric regurgitation. Pre-oxygenation, there are a lot of articles which have come up recently in 2020 about the using HNFC. And however, we all at present are using nasal cannulae to, for pre-oxygenation and marking the cricothyroid membrane early on using the USG. Another terminology which has come is help head elevated laryngoscopy position, which you should all know. So optimizing the first pass uh, success means there should be a horizontal alignment between the external auditory meters and the sternal notch and the Oxford uh, head elevated uh, laryngoscopy pillow or the troop pillow can give the adequate 25 to 30 degree uh, head up tilt. And why is it important? Because we need to keep the laryngeal, the pharyngeal and the oral axis in one line. Remember, you need to remove all these hair extensions which could interfere, interfere with correct positioning of the head and all these piercings, you can see the uvula piercing, the tongue piercing, these should be removed because this could be a reason for a foreign body there. As you prepare the patient, intrauterine fetal resuscitation should be started, uh, syntocinone should be off, Place the patient in the left lateral position with 100% oxygen, fluids, maintain the hemodynamic status and tocolysis with either turbutulin or uh, GTN spray. Now this reduces the panic both for the obstetrician and the healthcare team there and it also may prevent general anesthesia if there is no fetal distress. How do you optimize pre-oxygenation? There are uh, some changes which have been brought about by OA and the DAS team. The tidal volume breaths which were uh, given for three minutes have been reduced to two minutes and increased to five minutes if mask leak is present. Low flow apneic oxygenation with nasal cannula, five liters per minute. Eight vital capacity breaths for 60 seconds is more effective than the earlier four vital capacity breaths for 30 seconds. A tight mask to face seal where you do not allow any air entrainment would help in uh, adequate oxygenation and maintaining the target ETO2 at more than or equal to 0 0.9 with a nitrogen estimate at less than 4%. Now the fresh gas flow rate with the mask should be more than 10 to 15 liters per minute and two minutes of uh, pre-oxygenation is considered adequate. Now, efficacy or, uh, versus efficiency using high flow nasal oxygen in the period intubation. Uh, HFNO is supposed to be a better method of apneic oxygenation considering that anti atelectatic positive airway pressure effect is there, there is an apneic dead space washout. 
of nitrogen and carbon dioxide and reduced work of breathing. Now, this is based on the um, presumption that physiological imbalance occurs between gas consumption and uh, versus gas production in the pulmonary uh, airspace. And oxygen consumption at the alveolar level is around 250 mil per minute, but the volume of oxygen which diffuses from the blood into the alveolar spaces is about 8, 8 to 20 mil per minute. And this creates a pressure and flow gradient from proximal to the distal airways. And when we give a fresh gas flow with HFNO, you find that there is a continuous supply of oxygen at 35 to 75 mil uh, liters per minute, which gives a continuous supply of 100% oxygen and ensures that dead space nitrogen is washed off. So the advantage here is that face mask pre-oxygenation will denitrogenate effectively, but unlike high flow nasal oxygen, it cannot provide ongoing apneic oxygenation. So a strategy which combines the classic concept of pre-oxygenation with a technique assuring ongoing apneic oxygenation during the interval when there is a total paralysis has aptly been called per-oxygenation. So a combination of pre-oxygenation and per-oxygenation can increase your safe apnea time. Now, required pressure, according to the DAS guidelines, you should start when the patient is awake at 10 newtons, which is equal to somewhere around 1 kg, and increase it to 30 newtons in the unconscious patient. What has differed in the new guidelines is that you should have a very low threshold of reducing or removing the required pressure should intubation or mask ventilation prove difficult or for the insertion of a supraglottic airway device. Now the appropriate doses of inject induction agent. Don't keep your doses low of neuromuscular agents or induction agents considering that the patient, you, it will be difficult to bring out the patient if you decide on uh, awakening the patient. So propofol is considered a better induction agent in the sense that it suppresses airway refluxes and uh, it also reduces the um, failed intubation rate according to some research. Uh, saxamethonium is what we use routinely though it increases the oxygen consumption and chances of earlier desaturation are there. Uh, with uh, rock, uh, rocuronium, there is rapid reversal in three minutes as against nine minutes for saxamethonium. But then when you're using sugamatose, be careful that the dose pre-calculation takes a longer time. So you have to give enough time for preparing this drug. And of course, it's an expensive drug and till date, it's not widely available in our country. Another important change which has occurred in these guidelines is considering face mask ventilation uh, during apnea, the apnea period. And what is important is we used to teach that uh, you should not ventilate these patients because of fear of regurgitation and aspiration. But now they say that during this apnea time, you need to ventilate with a Pmax of 20 centimeters of water. So an obstetric rapid sequence induction list, you have to prepare the patient, you have to prepare the equipment and drugs and prepare for difficulty. Remember, every checklist should be verbally talked about and the anesthetic assistant reads it out and the chief anesthetist responds to it. For example, preparing the patient, have you started nasal cannula oxygenation because that is something which we keep forgetting. Preparing the equipment or drugs, have smaller sized uh, tubes been kept? Have you kept the video laryngoscope? And then for preparing for difficulty, you should always as a team leader, reduce the noise level in the theater, stop people from talking around. And the, in the event of a failed intubation, do you have a plan A and plan B in place? And what are your plans for extubation? All these should be uh, included in the checklist and verbalized. So preparing the patient, the drugs, equipments, and for difficulty will help you optimize maternal and neonatal outcomes. So the modified uh, RSI again shows some differences. 
uh, gentle bas bag mask ventilation for the first attempt, the second attempt, and the third attempt we'll talk about. The first attempt, you inflate at less than 20 centimeters of water. Adequate doses of your induction agent and blockers, required pressure, release for better view. External laryngeal manipulation and repositioning the head and neck when you face a difficult intubation. Use a bougie or stillet for intubation, smaller tracheal tubes. And now they stress that if you know that your airway is difficult, why not use video laryngoscope as the first equipment? So if you're proficient with its use, because there's a whole lot of video laryngoscopes that you can see here, and you need to be proficient with the use of them. So apart from this, if it is a second attempt at, at intubation, call in the most experienced anesthetist, re recommence your uh, back mask ventilation at every stage when you um, start another method of uh, intubation. Release the required pressure, external laryngeal manipulation. And for the third attempt, again, make sure that your extra dose of IV induction agent is given. Now, once you have intubated the patient, you should always verify the correct positioning of the endotracheal tube by using the ETCO2, which is the best method of doing it. So if there is a top hat, means you're clear, you are inside the trachea 99% of times. But if there is no hat, means it is dislodged or there could be an uh, esophageal intubation. So secondary methods which could help in confirming this is uh, uh, visualization of the larynx with the video laryngoscope or direct laryngoscope, esophageal detector device, fiber optic endoscopy or USG. Auscultation is not a very correct method of to be used in the pregnant patient who has large pests and uh, is obese also. So our Indian guidelines specially emphasize that every um, technique uh, or of airway intervention that we do, you should have your SpO2 minimum at 95%. And intubation attempts should be um, limited to two for every equipment that you use and nasal oxygenation should be mandatory. Once two attempts have failed, declare it as failed intubation. Extubation is another important area you should not um, miss out on. You should plan, prepare, and ensure that there is availability of staff and equipment of drugs. Now, you should always extubate in the head up position and uh, after extubation, use face mask ventilation. Only extubate you should not be in a hurry unless the patient is awake, responding to your commands, there is satisfactory SpO2 and T, uh, tidal volume. Now, if it had been a difficult intubation early on, you deflate the cuff and find out if there is an audible leak. If there is no audible leak, means there is unlimited um, edema of the larynx and you should delay extubation and send the patient to the ICU. So, and this is a very important point I want to stress that at this time, the theater team is packing. They are ready to go home. They are cleaning the floor. They are signing out. There's a lot of noise around. As a leader, make sure that there is absolutely no distraction in the operation theater. Now, since uh, OAA and DAS guidelines, when they came out in 2015, they did not talk about the anticipated difficult airway. So they came out with two decision aids. One is um, algorithms. One is the safe airway management. Can it be done out of hours? And they say that you need to consider these factors that uh, really will the patient go in for operative delivery? Will she need general anesthesia? Or the prolonged, will there be a prolonged time to secure the airway for general anesthesia? And... Uh, with the equipment, is requisite equipment available with you because most of the time it is out of hours. And uh, are there trained personnel ready to help you there? So if the answer is yes, you can consider making the patient go in for labor and 
with intrapartum management. And if the answer is no, then elective caesarean section for airway indication should be decided as a team with the obstetrician. You can try out regional anesthesia, but if it fails, then you go in for decision aid too. So you divide the patient into low or high risk here. The second uh, decision aid is, can safe airway management be achieved after induction of general anesthesia? So should you be securing the airway before giving general anesthesia or you can do it after general anesthesia? So for this, you need to consider the following factors. Is there an acceptably low risk of difficult mask ventilation, difficult SAD placement, intolerance of apnea or regurgitation or aspiration? And there is poor patient cooperation. If the answer is yes, then you need to, um, sorry, if it is yes, that means you have to give general anesthesia and um, secure the airway after general anesthesia. Now, if the answer is no, then the awake tracheal intubation options are, you can do it with the flexible bronchoscope, but now they advocate direct video laryngoscope, which uses less time, putting in an SAD or a front of neck procedure. So with these guidelines and decision aids, the anticipated difficult obstetric airway, you need to decide whether you need to continue with surgery there are certain irreversible causes, for example, uh, rupture uterus or fetal hemorrhage or placental abruption or umbilical cord prolapse or maternal collapse. In such situations, you will have to continue with surgery. But there are two situations when they say you can wake up the mother. If there is a periglottic airway swelling or by any method, with SAD or face mask, you are unable to maintain the SPO2 levels. In that situation, they advocate waking up the patient. But always remember, waking up the patient is not an easy situation because there is a lot of turbulence at that period of time. And the risk of laryngeal spasm can make you land up in a cannot intubate and cannot oxygenate situation. Now we come to the second scenario wherein there is unanticipated and emergency uh, difficult airway management. Apart from all the guideline um, steps which I discussed early on, if you follow these steps, you will not land up with this unanticipated um, difficult airway in most of the cases. So you need to call for help, optimize oxygenation, and remember algorithms specific to your institute should be available with cognitive aids. De determine the benefit of whether you need to wake up the patient or you need to continue with surgery. And what is better, a non-invasive method or an invasive ventilatory approach? So the, if any of these techniques fail, you need to have some combination of techniques. Verbalize the passage of time, which is very important the number of attempts the chief anesthetist has taken and the oxygen saturation should be verbalized. Test mask ventilation after each attempt whenever feasible. And you should always limit the number of attempts at tracheal intubation and SAD placement. The Indian guidelines specifically say that there should be a stepwise approach and you should focus on ventilation as well as oxygenation. However, oxygenation is more important, they say and you need to define and limit the attempts for intubation and SGA placement. Every time, just make sure that your SpO2 is more than 95 or equal to 95%. And if you cannot ensure that, then um, they have introduced the term ventilation failure and early on, you should go in for front of neck access before imminent hypoxemia occurs. The third scenario is the failed airway. And they uh, say that it's like the snowball effect when the from high over the mountain, the snowball keeps on gathering momentum and more of snow around. Similarly, initially failed laryngoscopy occurs, then we land up with failed intubation, then we land up with failed oxygenation. You have fetal hypoxia on your hands and you leave, um, you land up with both losing both the mother and the child. 
So the second algorithm is obstetric failed tracheal intubation. You need to call for help and your priority is maintaining oxygenation. If you are able to put the, place the supraglottic airway device, take only two attempts to do that, then you go back to face mask ventilation with oropharyngeal airway. It should be a two-person face mask uh, technique. Now, is oxygenation adequate? No, then you go into the third algorithm. If it is yes, you have to decide on waking up the patient or proceeding with surgery. Now, the third algorithm after the second, where you could not intubate, could not oxygenate, you need to call the ENT surgeon or the intensivist as a standby, give 100% oxygen, and you should ensure neuromuscular blockade. If neck front of neck procedure, which you tried, you are not able to restore oxygenation, that means you have to start with advanced life support and a perimortem caesarean section. And if you are successful, then you again have to decide whether you go in for waking the patient up or proceeding with surgery. So these were the DAS and the obstetric airway guidelines, which came in 2015 with the decision aids, uh, two decision aids for anticipated difficult airway. Now we come to two guidelines which have recently come up in 20 and 20, uh, uh, this month. Another guideline has come in from the DAS Society. And what is important and why I have included them is because a weak tracheal intubation again is of um, interest for the obstetric difficult airway. You see the ergonomics for um, a weak tracheal intubation. If you are using a video laryngoscope, the operator assistant has to stand at the back and your monitors have to be in line where you can see it yourself as the chief anesthetist. Well, if you are doing it with the fiber optic endoscope, you need to stand on the right of the patient. And accordingly, the position of the patient should be ramped up or made sitting for a weak tracheal intubation. So the DAS ATI technique, apply HFNO early. This really helps in taking care of oxygenation. And even if the patient goes into apnea, you can rest assured there will be no um, loss of oxygen to the airway. Lidocaine 10% spray, about 20 to 30 sprays are required. And remember, one spray is equal to 0.1 ml of 10%, which is 10 milligram. And um, if this is inadequate, then reapply um, local anesthetic up to a maximum dose. Further five sprays of lidocaine may be used to the tongue base. You sedate the patient with either um, remifentanil, which is definitely not available. Dexmeditomidin is also considered safe along with midazolam. And um, the DAS guidelines have brought out a paragraph for obstetric awake intubation where sedation with dexem or remifentanil is advocated. However, you need to inform the neonatologist. Topicalization, the dose of local anesthetic lignocaine should be 9 milligram per kg, and, but this should be calculated according to the pre-pregnancy body weight for dosing. Now, supplemental oxygen is very essential and identify the cricothyroid membrane early on with an ultrasound. The second guideline which came this year in August 22 is preventing the unrecognized esophageal intubation. Remember, and this is a consensus guideline from all the international airway societies where SN Maitra from India is also there, Shaila is there. Uh, this causes uh, glottic impersonation when you put in the laryngoscope too deep and you see you can in, in fact this looks like the tracheal rings here so the criteria for sustained exhaled carbon dioxide should allow you to decide whether the tube lies in the esophagus or the trachea all these four criteria should be uh, met with to decide that your tube lies within the trachea so level rises during exhalation and falls during inspiration, consistent or increasing amplitude over seven breaths and peak amplitude or 7.5 millimeter mercury or above the baseline. And whatever reading you get should be clinically appropriate. 
So this algorithm uh, decides on failure to satisfy the criteria for sustained exhaled carbon dioxide after intubation. Is removing the da uh, tube dangerous? No, remove the tube. If yes, you look at the SpO2 levels. Remove the tube if SpO2 deteriorates. And then you have to exclude esophageal intubation by your fiber optic video laryngoscope, your fiber optic endoscope, your USD or esophageal detector devices. And if the answer is no, then you attempt ventilation with either face mask or uh, a supraglottic airway device. Now, if sustained exhaled carbon dioxide has been restored, then you leave the tube with an inside. So the RCA and DAS came up with the slogan, no trace, wrong place, to enhance the importance of ETCO2 guidelines. So we have finished with the guidelines and now we come to two important parts, debriefing and the follow-up. Uh, always remember to put at full documentation whether the mask ventilation was easy, whether what was the grade of uh, Cormac and Lehan, what were the airway equipments or adjuncts you used, what are the complications that developed, and provide the patient with a difficult airway alert card. This is important for subsequent anesthetic she may be undergoing. A task debriefing is important. Identify aspects of good performance and congratulate them. Areas of improvement should be highlighted and what could be done differently should also be noted. So a high fidelity simulation training which should occur at least every year is a repeat mock drill. Reinforcement of the airway instrumentation, fauna and critical scenarios. Also, apart from these clinic, critical um, technical skills, we should always have uh, training for non-technical skills, leadership, decision making, communication, team working, situational awareness. All this are going to prevent the fixation errors, which are important reasons why we fail to intubate the airway. Our very own checklists and cognitive aids, which are specific to our institute, should be available. And share information on new equipment and techniques you use during management. Talk about it in your clinical uh, case report scenarios you discuss in your institute and also try to publish them. So what are the controversies and dilemma? Should the rescue supraglottic airway be used as the first rather than intubating the patient? Why not use SGAT? Now our major two concerns is that you may lose the airway due to edema, bleeding or dislodgement. And the second concern is that it could uh, potentially expose the parturient to the risks of regurgitation and pulmonary aspiration of the gastric contents. But the advantage, especially after a failed intubation, is that you are able to do it at the first attempt. It's a success rate. And apart from good ventilatory seal and effective oxygenation and protecting against aspiration, the recent second generation SEDs, it also provides a conduit for tracheal intubation. So especially in the high-risk parturients who are non-fasted, who have a high body mask index, who have a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease, and those with multiple pregnancies, please use the SAG FBI technique for intubating these patients. Now, in 2020, Mary Moshambi and her group also looked at whether we could really use it as the first device. And they say that there is insufficient evidence at present to replace the tracheal tubes. Aspiration remains the main concern, but of course, if you are a good endoscopist and you can determine the degree of gastric contents and the risk of aspiration, then you can go ahead and use it as the first one. In the end, a case scenario, she was a 36 year old G1, P0, a BMI of 60 in labor. And she did, there was no FHR abnormality. There was no, uh, the cesarean was planned because of non-progressive labor, but uh, she was MP4 with a short neck. 
However, she was fasted and clear oral liquids. Now, what will be your management option? This is always a dilemma. Will you, will you go in for airway management? Would you go in for regional anesthesia? So always remember that when you make a decision, balance the care and safety of two patients. On the one hand, you have a mother who there is an aspiration risk, rapid desaturation, severe hypoxia if you are not able to intubate, and compromised placental perfusion, aortic cable compression, fetal hypoxia can all damage the chances for fetal survival. So the management options, you have always have to discuss with the neonatologist and the obstetrician and your colleagues, reassess the FHR and simultaneously start your anesthesia plans. If you are going in for regional or combined spinal epidural or spinal, it's a difficult lumbar spine, a BMI of more than 60. So a USG guided um, method would be much better. For airway management, assess, the difficulty in anatomical and physiological, how much is the challenge? So at this time, you should always prepare for the worst case scenario. You should have a USD guided estimate of the CTN, both horizontal and transverse will give you an idea and mark it up on the skin. So the clinical consensus here was an elective cesarean section under general anesthesia with awake fiber optic intubation. And using um, Williams or Ovasi palm or white block, you have to use that. And lumbar epidural analgesia was given early on for postoperative analgesia before induction. And an awake fiber optic intubation with, was done with local anesthetic fentanyl and propofol. Uh, two senior anesthetists and one ENT surgeon was present and they managed to optimize the situation and maternal and neonatal outcomes were good. In the end, when we talk about the high-end video laryngoscopes, we talk about the newer uh, supraglottic airway devices. Are we really de-skilling or are we becoming super skilled? Now, the ability to perform difficult endotracheal intubation utilizing the direct laryngoscopy was a highly coveted skill in our times. And uh, what is important as anesthesiology teachers and as students of anesthesiology, never lose your touch from the direct laryngoscopy. It may be the only equipment which is available to you in far flung places. And so, you need to hone your skills in direct laryngoscopy as well as fiber optic bronchoscopy because the video laryngoscope may not be available or direct FOB may not be available. So you patient safety may be compromised if you descale your cells from direct laryngoscopy. So in the end, obstetric airway pearls always respect the obstetric airway. Never induce if you don't think you can get the airway always have backup devices and the suction ready, NPO and acid prophylaxis position ramp, pre-oxygenate adequately, ideally pre also pre-oxygenate with the nasal cannula and call for help early. Don't let your ego come in. Follow algorithms. You should have your own algorithms and uh, decision aids. Consider smaller endotracheal tubes and video laryngoscope should ideally be present. Uh, second generation LMA should be used for rescue and keep learning new skills, ultrasound guidance for the CTM and surgical cryptothyroid. And be careful of these dogmas. Persistence as trying to achieve adequate ventilation is not what we are going to do, but we need to maintain the SPO2 levels above 95. Ban on manual bag mask ventilation was something of a previous era. Now we need to oxygenate the patient at 20 centimeters of water. Waking up the partidant, always be careful. You can land up with CICO. And keeping needle cricothyroidomy for the last, remember it's not an easy, easy rescue area. So failing to prepare is failing, is preparing to fail according to Benjamin Franklin. And thank you very much for that patience. Thank you, madam. 
thank you for your excellent presentation keeping in mind the postgraduate and the consultant also and touching the guidelines updated guidelines even the guidelines uh, published in the last month also included in our presentation thank you very much madam and the discussion will be carried out by soap sir sir there is some questions in the chat box please soap sir sir excellent presentation ma'am thank you very much it's really enlightening take some questions ma'am uh, you have talked about the inflation pressure of 20 cm water Mm. Uh, is that okay for an obis uh, or do we need more the inflation pressures if we need more of inflation pressure pressure the obis patient yes ma'am see if we are talking about ideal situations i would always say an f hfno in these patients along with a uh, positive pressure not keeping the patient apneic throughout the period of neuromuscular paralysis 20 cm of water is what is advocated and not beyond that fine ma'am because and, uh, it, always uh, whatever we do there is always a risk of aspiration and regurgitation definitely ma'am you do not know about the obstetric airway and the total contents within the uh, gastric contents which are present unless you do an usg Uh, another question is if available ventilation with HFN, hfno versus nasal prong which would you uh, prefer or benefit from? if there is hfno and a nasal prong that is available which would you prefer during uh, laryngoscopy or extubation with end position well hfno is considered the best at present there are a lot of articles which are coming up with it at, as has said it is the best technique to uh remove nitrogen from the dead space and a continuous stream at 35 to 70 liters per minute ensures that oxygenation occurs during the period of neuromuscular paralysis and that is what we want we want to increase the safe apnea period and that is much better with hfno thank you very much ma'am uh, the very mind blowing sessions today i thank both the speakers uh, for giving us a wonderful talk yeah, sir can has a comment on on analgesia <laughs> thank thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you thank you so much thank you so much for uh, it is a great day in obstetric anesthesia we uh, we listened to the two great presenters today dr ravindra sir and dr sanandha gupta sir madam we are thankful to you and our, our viewers are very grateful to you sir you are sir and madam and uh, so much then we uh, sir please sir. thank you so much thank you sir so with that we will come to the end of this session uh, we will meet the next week with another two interesting topics with uh, madhusudan ubathiya sir and professor kannan sir thank you one and all we will meet the next week thank you thank you thank you so much thanks madam thank, thank you, you thank you thank you yeah right